So our next set of talks is the playground characterization study, and Randy is going to present it. We're actually in the experimental design stage again, so we have the opportunity to address questions like that for the, the uh, pilot playground study that we have coming up. And so we have the advantage of having been to the field, done measurements over crumb rubber infill material on, play, on, on playing fields, and now we're going to transfer that experience to uh, the question of can we do a good job measuring exposure concentrations on playgrounds. And so we do have an advantage of, of, of doing it now, and so we're going to run through um, backwards. Uh, it's just that one, right? That one? Yeah. That one. There you go. Okay, we'll jump right to the question. Um, no, I can't do that. We have, there's some slides going from there to the questions. And <laughs> see what Woody's saying about the, the equipment. Sometimes. Um, well, I can just talk a little bit. And in grad school, I was told to, to always be prepared to talk without slides. So. So, and we'll show you pictures, we'll work through the pictures when we get there, but I could start by saying there are some key differences between the playgrounds and the, the, the sports fields. Um, one of them is they're, they're typically smaller, more contained, often with trees or pavement or other media uh, uh, around them. Many times the, we see them shaded in, in the area and they have play structures in them, so it's not nice, a nice flat field. So you've got all these other things going on on in the in the area, um, the the cushion itself. What we're interested in is the is there for safety. It's there for if you fall on it, it gives a cushioning effect. And so it's a it's a poured in place material made from the crumb rubber products um, that that has a a cushioning texture. Um, so that's the one part that's new to this experiment than what we did previously. So we want to capture. The advantage here is we have some exposure activities uh, information. We have a, 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 an idea who our receptors are going to be. They're going to be kids. Um, and so we want to be able to capture both the, the inhalation pathway, like we did from the fields, but also the surfaces, because clearly kids are going to be playing on these surfaces. They're going to get down, get on the pads. Anybody that has children knows they're going to get right down into the, into the um, dirt or the pads themselves. So uh, to save some time when the slides do come up, I'll just suggest that what we're planning on doing for the air pathway is essentially transferring all of our experience from the fields to these playgrounds. So and what we talked know. about, what? Do, do we want to, I need to find. I could stop Go with here. the playground data. So I'll, I'll, when I come back <laughs> to you, uh, I'll jump right into the air, air measurements, and then we'll move to the surface measurements. That's what's new, so we'll go to that point. Thanks. Oh, sh should I get going at this point? Okay. Okay, so um, I'm going to then um, describe some of the information we have for micro level activities of children in playgrounds. And um, does everyone have, oh, it just went blank on the screen. I get started now. This is okay. Um, so, um, 
I just want to acknowledge the contributors to this, and also especially Paloma Beamer and um, Nicholas Lopez Galvez. Of course, they helped us on the other videotaping work there at the University of Arizona, and and they've done um, they've really done this work, and I'm kind of presenting it for them. And um, but they're really the, the the lead on this and should get credit for it. Um, so just to give some context to this information that we do have and, and um, which we hope to use to inform some of the exposure modeling, um, as many of know, you know, it's a challenge to collect time activity data for young children. Um, and we had an opportunity here with work that Dr. Beamer had done at, at Stanford some years ago to obtain California-specific data for young children. Um, and we want to take advantage of this, this data and use it. Um, Um, so our, our objectives here was to use this information to quantify dermal and mouthing activity in young children playing in playground environments. And um, Stanford had existing micro-level activity time series data um, and video footage for 24 children collected by their group um, in the, uh, late 90, 1998 and 2000. Um, so these were archived uh, material. They also actually worked with us on some of our work in the Salinas Valley and, and this built on that. Um, for this project, the videotapes were, were transcribed, so they had uh, to provide a second-by-second -second time series of everything a child contacted with their hands or mouth, as well as location activity levels. So a pretty detailed data set, and not too many like these are available for young children. If we look at the, the next slide, you can get a sense of the um, characteristics of those children. Um, many of them are very young, um, uh, one to two years old, and then went up to, um, oh, most actually were, well, up to uh, age 10, uh, but most of the children were in, um, were uh, one to six years old. So um, again, uh, 20, about 24 kids and a fair, fairly good cross-section. And just to give an example of um, how they uh, coded some of the data, and this is uh, also an example for some of the work they'll be doing with our um, uh, video tip data of soccer players. This is an example palette of software that they developed back then and have since updated and, and used in a number of different contexts. But um, when the uh, uh, videotapes are scored by students, they have this palette of information. And when events occur, they can code uh, what type of surface, what type of object, the location, and, and the contact type. Um, and so then this goes into a data set that then can be uh, extracted and analyzed. And they can um, um, use this to quantify uh, behaviors and activities. And specifically uh, for this analysis, the group looked at both contact frequency and also duration of contact. So if, say, uh, a child is putting something in their mouth, but they're also sucking on it for you know a period of time, that information will be recorded too. Um, so again, they uh, analyzed these archive videotapes. And um, if you look at the, the table on the right, this gives you an idea of some of the different uh, objects and surfaces that were evaluated. And if you look at outdoor, we talk about yard, park, garden, patio, and also driveway parking. To just explain that a little bit, some of these um, environments were, for example, in an um, apartment complex. So there might be um, driveway or kind of street-like um, avenues nearby, but we're not talking about being out in the street, but there could be these um, uh, playground environments also adjacent to, you know, other, other types of, um, I guess, landscaping or infrastructure. Um, but this, again, gives you a sense of what uh, information was available. And with that, they quantified um, activities including right hand, left hand, and mouth contact frequency. Um, as I mentioned, we looked at the um, contact with specific object and the total, um, also determined how long, the uh, total time the child was in view, and then, and then the duration of contact. And the data were summarized by age, um, and also looked at a little bit uh, by gender. So um, the, the total uh, time available was about nine hours of um, observation. Uh, period about a little over half an hour was not in view, and as you know, sometimes kids are behind trees or under playground structures, and you can't reach them. Um, and for each kid, there was at least about 20 minutes of video time. 
Um, so this was the source information for um, their work with this data. There were no significant differences in contact frequency or duration with objects and surfaces between the right hand and the left hand. So for the data we're going to be talking about going forward, we summarize them together. So um, again, there's a lot of numbers here, and I, I, I don't want you to focus on any specific number here, but just to get a sense that we have um, kind of a wide range of information. In this case, we're looking at contact frequency um, of their hands with different uh, surfaces or objects in their environment, including both um, floor environments, so that could be like a deck or um, a, a playground mat or another floor surface in the playground environment, dietary objects for ob um, food and different things they may be eating during the, the um, filming period, and then a whole range of non-dietary objects. And of course, all objects here is a, is a sum. And again, some of the key points here is that, you know, if we look at, say, the median value, um, we get some numbers. Um, and they're, they're quite high. I mean, if we look at the number of contacts, for example, that the child has with their hands and, and, and surfaces and objects in their environments, it's often, um, you know, dozens and, and up to hundreds. And if we look at the, the maximum values, you know, the kids are very busy in their environment. So there's a lot of opportunity for contact and transfer and exposure. Similarly, if we look at their uh, mouth contact, um, again, up in the upper range, you know, we're talking about hundreds of contacts with um, um, different objects. Most of this, in terms of the mouth, was for dietary. You can see at the, at the, the maximum <coughs> level, of course, the big ones were for diet. Um, but still, you know, they're putting their hands in their mouth, they're putting other objects in their mouth. Fortunately, they weren't putting their mouth on the floor too often. Um, one child was, was doing it. But again, just a sense here that this um, pathway, both in terms of um, hand to mouth or object to mouth are potentially important. And, and again, another piece of this that I, that I think the, the folks at Arizona have really pioneered is also not just looking at contact, but also duration. And again, uh, you know, we can see for some kids, say with their hands, they um, have relatively, you know, little contact, say with food because they're not eating, but then, you know, up around, 22 minutes per hour up in the maximum. So that's a kid that's hanging on to like a, a snack or something else and they're, they're keeping it in their hands for a long time and then they may be putting it in their mouth for a long time and, and sucking on it for a long time. Um, so just to make the point here again that we have a range of information here both um, in terms of their hand to object, hand to mouth contact and also then also how they're interacting with their environment with their mouth and potentially getting um, uh, material uh, into their body either by eating things or by hand to mouth and, and experiencing both dietary and non-dietary ingestion exposures. Um, we do find some differences in age, which we expect. Um, uh, this is mouthing frequency. It was significantly higher in children uh, and younger children. That's not unexpected. We know kids' uh, hand-to-mouth behavior peaks between one to two years of age, so it's not surprising that we have higher frequencies in young children, and this should also be considered for uh, when thinking about exposure. And um, similarly with Dura mouthing duration. Um, it's also longer in younger kids and, um, and particularly non-food objects, so they're putting some things in their mouth or, or other, um, other interactions. So this is things we all know from, you know, why we're concerned about young children and exposure and risk to um, potentially hazardous materials and this information from their, uh, their data set helps confirm that. And this is, again, specific to California children in playground environments. Um, so uh, just a brief summary, wide variability in children's interaction with playground environments, differences observed by age, and this information will be uh, important that can inform exp exposure modeling. And there is a plan also to do some additional work with this data and, and look at contacts with um, other body parts than just the, the hand and mouth. Oh, I don't think we actually have... Uh, specific charge questions, but any comments and discussion are welcome, or we can also possibly wait until Randy's done with, with his piece. Why don't we wait? So Randy, you go ahead. Open. 
Time's up. All right, I'm out of here. Present. Does anybody have some discussion questions or questions for Aza? Okay, Tom. Um, well, it's a broader comment. I, I think it's really useful information. It, it's quite comprehensive. Uh, I guess what I worry about further down the road is you, you have a number of contacts, duration of contacts, but ultimately it's going to depend in terms of getting the real intake of a chemical substance from the crumb rubber or the crumb rubber itself is we need a, a loading or a transfer factor. And it's always dependent on that. So you could have this table of you know, 10 minutes per hour, five minutes per hour of contact uh, with your hands and there's carbon rubber on your hands, but we still won't know. I mean, we still have to work to figure out what the loading factor is, A, for the crumb rubber, and then B, for the chemicals of interest that are in the crumb rubber. So I think it's, it's ultimate utility will, uh, will depend not so much on the resolution you have in time and activity, which you can get from video. It's really wonderful when you videotape. You can disaggregate it down to the second by second activity, but still it's going to be constrained by transfer and loading um, on, on the hands or the objects uh, that children are contacting. Uh, in terms of, because we want to know not just you know how many times they lick the floor, which is not a lot, but you know what goes in after the, you know as a result of that activity, and that really is, unless you can at the same time do a lot of biomonitoring and measure what's in the child that does that, it's hard to calibrate the transfer of chemical or crumb rubber to the child for that specific activity. Ed. So I, I, if you, oh, okay. <laughs> I wasn't going in order. Ed. So I, so I think I agree. This is an incredibly valuable data set, and I can't believe it's been 15 years since Paloma did this as a grad student. But um, my my question is sort of on the the generalizability and the represent representativeness of this. Uh, when you because you said something about this is relates to California children. And so I assume, is there some seasonality to this or is it just restricted? So are you thinking about this in terms of sort of being the higher level of sort of warm temperature exposures or is this also done, is, this, is there a range to this? I don't remember from the papers. Maybe I could answer my own question by looking at the, the manuscripts. Paloma's on the phone. Yeah, is Paloma on the phone and she could respond? Yes, I'm here, can you hear me? Yes. Right, so um, I just want to acknowledge that this was all data collected by um, Jim Leckie's group at Stanford in the late 90s, so actually even before I was a grad student, I just get to be the repository. Um, but they, I believe, from looking at the footage, it was over two years, and um, it was through all seasons, and it was everywhere in the peninsula to San Jose. So there was kids that are out in Pescadero that were really cold environments, all the way to you know some very hot days in Mountain View represented in this data set. I haven't gone back and looked at the specific children to um, make sure which ones they are, but I think you do have some of the Bay Area seasons in there. Okay, thank you. So I had, I had one quick question. Um, so I'm trying to understand big picture wise, so this, this uh, videotape data is gonna inform on exposure of, of young children to playground environments, but are you also I think there's maybe mention of breaking it down by kind of time spent in turf-like environments, and is that going to be used also for the turf study, or um, is there no data like that in, in part of the videotaping? Uh, w those data are being collected, yes, in turf environment, it was going to inform the bystander okay. scenario, how they interact with an outdoor environment, kind of grassy environment, what do they play and how, how they interact, yeah. Thank you. We've gone ahead and quantified from the same videotapes all the times the children were playing on turf environments and what they were doing, um, whether in a park or in their backyard, so to kind of represent bystanders. Um. <laughs> all right, thank you for your patience. Um, so I'll jump right into it. We've already had the introduction. The difference between playgrounds, we had talked about that. These playgrounds are often shaded. They're more contained, and there's a lot of stuff in the way. 
a lot of stuff in there. Um, but feeding back to the, the exposure scenarios and activity patterns, we now, we have a good sense of what goes on in these. So my question as we move forward is, we have an opportunity to make measurements. Let's make them relevant um, as close to we can, as we can to exposure concentrations. So I'm gonna go through three things, really just I, the description of the playground is pretty well done. I'm um, gonna talk about the environmental and air samples, which we already have a good sense of. We've done that already. But the, the new thing is sampling the surfaces, and I'd like to get some feedback on that. So I'll talk about what our ideas are, and then, and then we'll try and get some feedback. So the air sampling, overall the sampling idea would be to, to arrive at one of these playgrounds um, with the idea of putting it together a three-hour monitoring event. With, the, with the, the fields, we used five because we wanted three hours of activity. Three hours is kind of the window that's dictated by our SVOC sample. I want to collect samples for that period of time. So that's an integrated sample over time. So that's where the three-hour window came. Um, the, the intent is to collect the uh, air samples from somewhere towards the center or towards the middle of this environment, um, this playground area, with another sampler off the, off the playground just to get some, some background, some reference, and add to that database. Um, we do plan to collect temperature data. Uh, hopefully in, in shaded and sun areas, if that's feasible. Sometimes these things are totally in the shade for the entire period of time. Um, and we'll get the offsite temperature as well. Uh, a thing to keep in mind is we won't have any subjects performing any activities on the deck at this time while we're doing measurements, but the researchers are gonna be active and, and that'll be ongoing at the, at the area. We're not gonna step off and just let the samplers run, so we'll be doing other things. Um, so I'll jump right to the punchline. The question really about these samples, I, I've, we've talked a lot about what we're measuring, but the question is what's a good relevant uh, uh, sampling height for these, these uh, samples that we're gonna collect. We're proposing or suggesting, um, we, we, we did get to one field or one playground just as a, a quick in and out to kind of get a sense of how it would be to work in that area. And, and as Marion showed earlier, we have a similar pattern as you move up away from the surface of a decreasing concentrations. Again, this is benzothiazole in the, the MIK chemical, the ones that we know are entire material. And so we do still see this same trend to a certain degree uh, moving up away from the surface of the material, the, the, the pad itself. And so our thought is it might be a good idea rather than go right to the 42 inches, you know, roughly a meter high for a child's breathing zone, we're thinking let's drop that down to 20. Let's drop it down about half, right about in the middle. We don't wanna go all the way to the deck because there's probably a lot of variability there, but if we get up into a bit of a mixing zone in the 20 inch uh, range, that's kind of our intent for all these samples. Um, obviously the stratified samples will be taken at different different depths and then the, the particle instruments because it's just there's just too much stuff to work with, we'll probably put those up at a meter height as well to, to get that sense. So. That's one of the questions we'll cycle, circle back to at the end of the talk, but that's kind of the background and rationale for, for what we're planning to do with the air samples. Um, what's new with the playgrounds that we didn't do in the, in the sports fields is the surfaces. We didn't take any, any direct measurements of the surfaces. We collected crumb, infill, brought back to the lab, and we're looking at that, but we didn't really do anything to try and characterize this uh, adhesion rate or this contact rate or this uh, residues on the surface that kids might come in contact with. And we wanna try that here. We wanna do that at this, at this level. Um, so I wanted to point out um, I wanted to point out there's a it was a picture at the top. I guess it's just don't see it because it's quite it's dark. Um, I wanted to point out the, the sponginess of these surfaces. And the video here is just to show you that, that sort of sponginess. Um, and the top image was sort of to show you the, the texture. So those are two things that we're working with that are, you know, there's a lot of methods available for sampling surfaces. But the playground mats are somewhat unique. They're, they're sort of textured like a carpet. Um, and rough like a carpet, they're spongy like a linoleum, but they're not either of those. They, they, don't, they don't feel like either of those. They just, um, they have a problem with, when we were doing this preliminary stuff, the, these tests, um, things that didn't work, for example, the, the wiping with a, a cloth didn't work because it just shredded the cloth. The material is that, that kind of a texture. It's a sticky kind of texture. Um, and if you, if you drag a sleigh across this material, you're likely to roll up the material. 
Um, the blotting I had a problem with because it just didn't seem to penetrate the, the porosity of the material. So, so we kind of threw those, those three options out and went towards the idea of, of doing a two-step process. I'm going to go to the next slide and just kind of talk through that. The two-step two process would include a vacuuming, standardized vacuuming method that uses a, it's called a high-volume small surface sampler. It's a, it's, a, it's a vacuum that's standardized with flow rates and, and a, a cyclone to separate particles and such. Um, so the idea would be to use that in, con in conjunction with a, a roller tool that uses polyurethane foam or depending on if you're doing metals or not, if you're doing metals, we use a cellulose fiber on a roller that is weighted to represent the number of the pressure, 9,000 pascals, the pressure of a child pushing on stuff or, or getting on surfaces. So that you can calibrate the pressure on the surface as that roller goes across the surface, more of a standardized way. And so what we're what we're hoping to do or, or leaning towards, and we'd like the panel's you know, feedback on, is, is in using these two standard methods, we're not developing something new, we're just applying something that's pretty well established to a new application. Um, if we do this, can we use these two pieces of information to try and, 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 and educate or inform us about what these exposures might be on the surface? Um, we're gonna be analyzing for the, the semi-volatile chemicals that'll you know, essentially be on the surfaces. If, if they're gonna be there, that's what we'll pick up. Um, but we'll also pick up dust and, and, and uh, residue fine material as well. Um, the approach that we're proposing to do is to, to, to use two zones, use one for metals because we don't wanna use any metals in that sample, use the other one for organics because you know, it's just, they're, they're two very different sampling techniques. So once we identify the two zones, as you see on the screen here, we would collect multiple samples, the first being a sample that, that uses the roller. And I've got the, the prototype, well, it's not the, it's the one we're using over here on the ground if we wanna take a look at it. Um, but we use the roller with the polyurethane foam on, on side B and with the, with the fiber um, cloth on side A and collect a sample with the roller on an unvacuumed just to, as you find it surface. So you're gonna have all kinds of stuff on that surface. Um, it's gonna collect all that it can sticking to that simulated skin, which is the polyurethane foam or the cellulose fiber. Um, and then in C and D is where we're gonna use the vacuum and actually vacuum up dust, stuff that can be uh, resuspended or however the vacuum, it pulls up the dust fraction and we're gonna call it the dust fraction. Um, and then once that's done, we'll come back with E and F, meaning metals and organics, and re-roll that surface that's been vacuumed. So we're gonna have three different samples here representing um, qualitatively in a way, three different things that we hope or plan to put back together to make sense of what these dermal contacts would be for, for, for children. Um, so that's kind of an overview of what we're thinking as we move forward. I don't know, the timeline still is, I guess we're waiting for it to warm up a bit uh, and it's getting there, it's coming up fast. So we'll be out in the field soon enough, but I wanted to kind of run this plan past you guys and see what kind of feedback we got. The goal is to go out this summer around June to July in a very hot day. We're ready for the, all the panel discussion, and we want to be done by 3.05. Question first. Before well, we I, well, that's part of the discussion. Okay. <laughs> well, then we can discuss my question. But um, So the idea is that this stuff is more sealed, in a sense, than the turf fields. Is that what you mean when you talk about the surface, that there's not... This, like if you jumped on it, the poof wouldn't come Exactly. Up. It's a poured-in-place material, and so it's a spongy-type material, so it doesn't have... Like if you slid your foot across it, you don't see this, the crumb coming back up because there's no loose material okay, in general. Okay, thank you. I, I didn't know what poured in place meant in this context. So I... I the right I, words there? I don't know if that's the right terminology. Yes. Yeah, it actually creates a, a foam pad, essentially. It feels like a spongy pad. It's a similar material in some of the gym. You go for weight training, those kind of pads. They have met, yes. 
that is a playground mat itself with, with a continuous layer with the rubber on the top. Okay, Ed. I have two two comments or questions on with regard to your first question about whether it should be at 20 inches or 40 inches, et cetera. I mean, I think in some ways I'm sort of inclined to, to look for the extremes or at least the potential for higher exposure. So I would argue for the 20 inches because I think you're liable to get younger children playing on this. And they're going to be shorter. And I think that based on what we've seen, at least uh, for some of the VOCs and so forth, there is going to be a gradient with distance from the surface. And so... I think that uh, you want to be closer, and I think that's a good compromise. So I would argue for 20 inches. Um, on the other, on another aspect of the your little clever sampling machine, um, there's a you said 9,000 pascals. The paper says 8,000. 8,000 pascals. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. But but either way, I have a question about that because it's not, it seems like that sort of evenly distributes and sort of rolls over in a smooth fashion. And I think little kids running around and jumping on these things in terms of planting and coming off of their feet may exert more than that. I don't know whether that's true or not, but I think somebody ought to check on, you know, on a strain gauge or, you know, I mean, it, it's fairly straightforward, certainly in a physical ther physical laboratory to be able to check, you know, what that driving force is just to reflect that if you have a, a 20 or 30, 40 pound child running around on this, what the, what the pressure is. And that's, Maybe that's what you ought to set this to, in terms of weighting it down. Can I respond and and with as a conversation as we go? Yeah. Um, I, I, the trade-off. I, I I agree with what you say, and I and we do have like sit machines in 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 the lab where we have a, a machine that just sits and stands up or jumps on a couch or whatever. It's a robotic like, and and those those tools are available for aging materials and and things. But our goal is to get something. It's kind of like using the LD50. We want to we want to go for something that's really repeatable and 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 as consistent and as as relevant as possible. And then we could make make our adjustments or our projections as far as what a higher or a lower. Um, I think what we're discussing here, like impact, not right. necessarily the the constant touching. But I think in terms of exposure, when a child is running over it, they're going to have that impact yeah. that may lead to the exposure is sticking to them, their shoes and their material or them. And so that's why I say, again, leaning it towards more potentially the higher extreme risk. It's maybe just a philosophical difference. Yeah, at some, at some point, if you actually, the actual use of it, you completely smash out your polyurethane foam and you're actually, you know, you're basically just pushing it into the, the cushion. So that may, in fact, be a, you know, a good way, something to consider. Yeah, maybe if I play on a children's thing, I don't know about a 20 or 30 pound kid. So. Tom? Kind of, uh, really an extension, I think, of my last comment, which is, again, this is, in a way, what you have as, as a way to get loading or transfer, right? This is going to be it. I mean, I, I know you don't have human subjects right, opportunities here. I mean, you can't take a couple of children and wipe their feet and hands after you see them. Right. That probably would give us more insight than a lot, but... I guess that's, I mean, and again, it's a question I don't think it has an answer, but it's just to think about this um, kind of impedance matching, you might call it, and, you know, matching up what we have on activity base, where we, we're going to have some really good information, uh, generically at least, not for specific populations at playgrounds, but generic information about how children interact with surfaces. And you're going to have these uh, experiments that tell us a lot about the uh, transferability, the, the um, how how well the surfaces give up dust and chemicals when contacted, and I, I still think it's going to be a bit of a challenge to put these pieces together to do the actual quantitative transfer of chemical. And and again, I don't know what the answer is. It's just something we have to focus on how to keep that as reliable as possible. And to see what, where the uncertainty and the uh, particularly the uncertainties about how we model that, because I think we're going to have to do the model when we do the risk assessment. We, I mean, you guys, we're not going to do the assessment, but we have to think about you know, what it means. Actually, along those lines, um, about ten years ago, 
e p a did have to do a risk assessment for arsenic with arsenic treated wood preservatives and kids on playgrounds and valerie's are terry and jim shu did it and that is in the literature and it was also went through the science advisory board at e p a because it was sort of a big deal risk assessment um, they used the sheds model. They developed what were the biggest uncertainties, and I think it was um, it, part of it was thickness of the of, of the layer and how how much stuff stayed on the I think on the hand. But it is in the literature, and I think you can also get it. But it's a good place to start, at least on kids and playgrounds. And you know, if you decide to use that model or some other model, what are what did they predict as the greatest uncertainty? Certainties, so that that could be useful to you. Yeah, I agree. That's a good point. I mean, that 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 would be the sheds type model, and would probably right, be the best you could do as a as a precedent. And it was, and then Valerie brought in like, mm -hmm. the Stanford time activity data, so it's already a precedent right. for that. So yeah. it would be useful. I mean, there may be things you want to change about it, but at least it's a starting pl place, especially for uncertainty in the model. Amy, do you have any other comments? Go ahead, Debbie. I just really think it's important to do the 20 inches, and I think it's really important. It's going to be really important to get a hot day because, I mean, I remember taking my kids these things when, when they were little, and, I mean, coaches are smart. Like, coaches don't let their teams practice when it gets too hot. Parents, we're not professionals. We're not necessarily <laughs> smart like that. We're sitting there going, oh, oh it really smells. <laughs> Anyhow, um, and then I don't, I guess I don't understand what's wrong with, I, I'm just struggling to see how the HVS3 is going to work on this surface and what it's going to be picking up because I feel like it's going to be picking up, you know, dirt that got blown over from the the grass that was nearby and, and random things. And I don't understand what's wrong with the blotting and how the drag sled thing is going to be better than the blotting. Because I feel like if you're worried that it's too porous to blot, isn't it also too porous? I mean, unless that has more pressure applied than you can apply with your hand. And also, the kids, I mean, I understand Ed's right. They are, are going to really pound down on their, when they're jumping, but they're predominantly in shoes at that point. So what they're contacting with, is with their hand. And I would think your hand blotting is going to be better able to replicate the pressure a kid would apply to some degree. So I don't know. I'm struggling a little bit with the surface. Yeah, no, that's that's good. Very good thoughts. The I, when I you arrive get at from one the of picture, these, it looked like you were doing a great job blotting. Yeah, in that I mean video. that's that's how you do it. it just, it, it as we did that, it, you didn't first thing break you, the equipment. I didn't break a thing. Yeah, I did. Um, but the first thing is you pick up a lot. You just said, the, how do you separate the stuff that's blowing onto the field or onto this pad and and otherwise? And that's why we kind of thought about if we brought in something that was more of a, a systematic approach to collecting that first, and then see what remains, um, and then in order to make sense of those two, go ahead and try and collect it without doing that pre-cleaning of the surface. Because all of those factors or all of those fractions, if you want to call them that, are important. They're, they're, they're contact media. Um, the, the dust, even if it came from elsewhere, has been residing with, the, with the, poured, the surface for some period of time and exchanging friends back and forth to a point where the dust that you're picking up off of that surface may be relevant to it as, a, as an exposure pathway or contact media. And so we wanted to make sure we captured that. And the blotting didn't really do a good job capturing that because, I mean, there's, there's pieces of fibers and things there. And, and, and I just, I, for me, I needed to just step back and try and get something more systematic. And that's why that, meant that sort of roller. So you felt that when you were blotting, you could see dirt that you weren't able to pick up, is what you're saying. that or you were picking up or, or either some large chunk of, of material was coming involved in, into the, the fabric when you were picking it up. So it was just, it was mm -hmm. not a very consistent, it was what I was struggling okay. with, trying to get a consistent, um, repeatable approach. And I'm not even, you know. Did you guys analyze that blot to no, see what kind no, of things you're getting yet. yet? We haven't done that, no, no. I mean, it might make sense to, I mean, because obviously you're going to line up a few of these playgrounds. Three. Only three. The plan is three, if I'm not correct, right? 
Yeah, uh, part of it is because of the time issue and how much resources we have. Uh, we are like, involving a lot of sample analysis now, you can see in data analysis. Uh, the, the playground studies is designed as a preliminary pilot scale to look at is there any poten potential concern. So we, we are targeted to find very hot area with different age of the surface. Uh, I know it's n equal to one, but it will give us some idea on what what are we looking at in terms of playground. So it sounds like you're not going to have like you're not going to be able to analyze anything in between. Like this, just you go. I, mean, I think maybe you do another strip on either side that's also a blot. That's what because I'm I think you say, it, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think you've only got one shot there. And so it might make sense just to anal just to have more, you know, because I'm just worried you won't pick anything up with the others. So maybe a, a purple stripe on either side of your picture that represents the blot. That's a good a good suggestion because it's not hard to collect the sample. I mean, if you have it right. And one other scenario we're here trying to look at is children crawling on the surface. So that is more like a rolling kind of scenario than jumping and bouncing. Because little kids, they are kind of like a little bit dragging, but be aware these surfaces are very rough. So I would say they would, the pain will tell them to drag yourself, but kind of crawling around gently, I hope. <laughs> Sandy doesn't have any questions, and um, I agree with, with Debbie. You need to do something that allows you to look at various ways to, um, to do the surface samples. Um, when I left EPA, Dan Stout was the person who was looking at all of this. You know, I can't remember, but I just remember that I didn't like using the puff roller, and I actually went back and looked at some of our CTEP data because I thought we weren't... I de we weren't detecting anything, but that wasn't the case. But it seemed to me that there were a lot of places where it didn't work well. But, you know, this was a long time ago, again. Um, but you might try contacting Dan Stout, because he was the one who was spending a lot of time looking at, you know, potential surface. I mean, this has been a problem that's gone on as long as people thought they needed to take surface measurements. And you're pre-cleaning all this stuff, right? You're extracting the pups yeah, yeah. and, and yeah. all oh, that. Okay, yes, good. Before. For sure. Yeah, that's. In fact, that's another. That's another. It's not a driving factor, but the fact that the method is well developed for polyurethane foam in our lab is another. Another. Um, I mean, if you know how to fly a plane, then you're much better off. You're less likely to make a mistake, right? And we didn't want to get. We didn't want to get too far into method development, so that's why we're trying to select existing methods and, and put together a puzzle that way. So, but yeah, everything's pre-cleaned and, and blanks are used. And we now, oh, go ahead. No, no just, like yes. <laughs> okay, we'll be back at 310 for public comments.